Hello everyone and welcome to this tutorial on the Inibuild A300. Some of you who have been on this channel before might have a little deja vu and you'd be correct because um, something with a very similar picture happened around about a year ago uh, when I made a tutorial for the Inibuild A300 on X-Plane and also a few weeks ago I created one for Microsoft Flight Simulator. A few things have changed. First of all, we didn't have a Dan Air London livery uh, a few weeks ago. Um, a few updates have come out. And also, while trying to condense it from the very long version I've made from uh, Explain, I think I overdid it a little bit and I skipped some very important aspects of the A300. Uh, so I thought the um, livery coming out that gave me an excuse to redo um, uh, the tutorial. So now the tutorial is focused on rather than a tutorial on a plane itself because uh, that would take several tutorials. It's a very complex airplane. Um, what uh, I have done last year when uh, I made a tutorial for the uh, version on Explain 11, I collected a, an FCOM from um, Airbus, an original FCOM, uh, from the um, A310 actually, uh, and I'll explain in a second, and then I condensed it um, into the normal operations. So today, instead of um, examining every single uh, system and uh, um, function of the plane, we will just go through normal operations exactly as per the FCOM. Now the FCOM, as you can see over here, um, comes from, um, as I was mentioning, actually an A310 because the A300 originally, the A300B, had completely different avionics, a completely different flight deck compared to the Inibuild version, which simulates uh, the same actual copy that came out when it turned into A300-600 and is identical to the A310. So any FCOM from the A300 that we can find online is irrelevant to the Inibuild version. I have to take the FCOM from the A310 and um, do a quite a fair amount of hours of work on it because um, the one that is available online takes into consideration a lot of different types of equipment, engines, so the same page of the FCOM might be repeated four or five times with slight variations. So it is a, a, a bit of a nightmare, uh, but working on adjusting the PDF, making it suitable for single pilot operation and for flight simulation, I've created what you can see over here. Um, now I've branded it uh, Dan Air London. Um, this is a virtual airline that um, a friend of mine came up with um, the idea of creating um, a, a retro virtual airline. Uh, a few of us um, put together a lot of work to find old timetables, schedules from defunct airlines that no longer operate, and that is the one caveat. The airline that we operate uh, do not um, do not exist anymore. And uh, give an excuse because the problem is when you want to fly for virtual airlines, uh, uh, you cannot fly all planes. If you want to fly a DC-3, a DC-6, or an A300, uh, you don't find um, any virtual airlines that have them because they're all on current airlines. And so we uh, found a solution to this problem and created uh, Dan Air London. It started just with Dan Air and then we added several other airlines. So at the moment we have quite a collection of airlines and then we expand it from the UK. It originally was supposed to be only the UK and we expand it to um, other countries as well. So at the moment we operate uh, simulate operations from Dan Air, First Choice, British Caledonian, Brathens in Norway, Meridiana from Italy, uh, Sabina, uh, we have as well Crossair, Air Berlin, Canjet and, uh, and others. Uh, in terms of planes, it's incredibly exciting because we fly planes like the DC-3, so you can use the default um, Microsoft Flight Simulator DC-3, the DC-6 from PMTG. We have the base of the B British Aerospace 146 in all its variations. Uh, we have the ATR, the MD-80, so you can use the Leonardo MD-80. Um, we have the 747-200, which should uh, be a work in progress at the moment. Uh, hopefully somebody will make the 727 that we operate, then the 737-200. 
uh, you can fly all the PMTG lineup uh, apart from the 900, but we have the 6, 7, and 800. Um, 757, which hopefully will come at some point this year with Bluebird simulation, um, and a lot of Airbus. We have the A300, the A310, A320, 30, and 40. So a really incredible lineup. So if you want to have a look, uh, Google Dan Air Virtual, uh, it will bring you to our website that tells you a little bit about our operation. And just to give you an idea of all the different excuses that it gives you to fly all their liners, this is the map of destinations we have. So we fly to, uh, at the moment, more than 300 different destinations on more than 4,000 different routes. So please do come and have a look. And especially to fly the A300, we have uh, quite a few options. So FCOM, let's start. So what we're going to do, I'm going to go through the entire FCOM line by line and simulate a flight starting from Gatwick, flying to Ibiza, which is one of the routes we have for Daniel London. And all these are real world routes. And we all bought, the five of us bought um, actual paper timetables and uh, uh, old vintage paper timetables. So this is absolutely 100% realistic. Now, we go through every single line of the FCOM. Sometimes there will be quite a lot of procedures explained. I might, I might skip some of those uh, because if you decide to get the FCOM, which is available on flightsim.to, uh, you might want to get more into the nitty grit and of the uh, procedures, but I'll try and condense it a little bit. Um, so let's get started with the FCOM. So, um, the very first page, we start from the flight preparation, and we check the technical condition. This is something that you'll do more or less in, in uh, your airline office uh, before getting to the plane. Uh, so it's not necessarily important. I've already uh, started, uh, I've already created a sim brief flight plan. So I've already done all my fuel planning, all the route. I have everything loaded onto Navigraph. So you can see the routing and everything. So that's all done. So I didn't want to bore you with that one. So the first page has been taken care of and let's move to the next one. Perfect. So next page. Over here, we continue. Well, we start the safety exterior inspection. So completion ensures that the aircraft and surrounding areas um, are not obviously unsafe for operation. So on arriving at the aircraft, uh, so as you're walking up to the aircraft as uh, the um, pilot, uh, you will check um, a couple of things. So mainly the nose wheel chocks, which we need to set up. Now, normally I don't use them, and then later on you'll see why. But if we go on to ground equipment, we can toggle the, the wheel chocks. So as you get closer to the aircraft, you're going to see the front wheel chocks are there in position. We're going to move to the back and we have the back one as well on the main landing gear. And we're going to check that the landing gear doors are closed. Um, we're not talking about the small one over here. We're talking about the main one here on the belly of the plane. And then we're going to check the APU area. We're checking that the inlet and outlet are clear. The inlet is this over here. At the moment it's closed, so it doesn't really look like an inlet, but it would open then when you start the APU. And the outlet is over here. So the safety, safety exterior inspection is complete. Now let's step into the cockpit. Now, we're now moving on to the preliminary cockpit preparation. Now let's read items marked with an asterisk that only steps to be completed during transit stop. So, okay, perfect. Now the following procedure performed by the pilot of flying ensures that required safety checks are made prior to the application of electrical power to avoid inadvertent um, system operation and danger to aircraft and personnel. So we'll start with uh, the checking that the ignition is off. So let's look at the overhead. Ignition over here, it's off. Wipers one and two here are off. Throttle levers down here are in the idle position. Reverse levers are stored fuel HP valves, so high pressure over here, uh, they are off. The landing gear is down. You can see the landing gear lever here. And the rear and overhead circuit breaker panels 
are all checked. Circuit breakers are not simulated in any build, so you can have a look, but there's no way of pulling them. But that's it. Let's pretend we check those and it's all good. And we move on to batteries and emergency. Emergency inverter. Now, battery one, two, three, you'll find them here. One, two, and three. We check that they're off, and then we check that they're above 25 volts. You can see here the indication, turn the switch, battery three, 28, battery two, 28, and battery three, 20, uh, battery one, 29. So perfect, the voltage is good. We can now, battery one, two, three, select auto, one, two, and three. We're checking that the flow bars are in line. So you can see the flow bar is in line with the diagram uh, printed on uh, the actual panel. So that's good. We check the, the AC emergency on the inverter light. It is illuminated. And then we should check as well the DC essential on battery. That takes a few seconds, but it will come on over here in a little bit. Then we check the APU fire protection, which is over here. Let's see if I can show you this way. So APU fire protection is going to be over here. As you can see here, the DC essential on part is on now. For the APU, we check that the fire handle is in and is latched. You can see they're all latched up here with this one. Loop A and B push button. PB means push button. And this one and this one are in. We check that the script test push button over here. We press it and check that the light illuminates. And then loop test push button, which is over here. We press that. Loop A light comes on. We loop warning activation. And after a few seconds, loop B illuminates together with the fire handle and the CRC. So the continuous repetitive chime. That's all done. We release the button and everything switches off in a few seconds perfect now electrical external power if available illuminated on so electric uh, external power is here at the moment is available um, if it wasn't you can toggle it here toggle ground power unit so it's available so we turn it on and we can start hearing the avionic fans, there's a lot more has come alive in the cockpit. Now, after that, APU start. We're not going to do it because we're going to be on the ground for quite a while. Normally in airports, many international airports, there is a limit of 15 minutes for the APU right, because of noise and pollution. So we're not going to use that for now. We'll turn it on later. Move to the next page cockpit lights as required so if it was dark you could start um, selecting all the cockpit lights you have here on the left of the um, captain and then on the right of the first officer then you have here the FCU is controlled from here and then then the pedestal and the overhead are controlled with these knobs at the moment we don't need anything it's nice and bright now we're going to check that the probe window heat is there off you have them here this is the win the probe heat and these two are the window heater so they're off we check the vent panel which is here all lights are off and the on ground overboard green flow bar is in line and that checks and then we check the annunciator lights which are here, bottom right of the overhead. We put it to on. We see all the bulbs are working and we hear the three wind shear warnings. And now we can put it back to bright. Moving on to the next column, air bleed compartment temperature. We check that the APU bleed is on, not in this case as we haven't started the APU. We check that the pack valves one and two push button switches are on and they are 
otherwise it will show off they show fault obviously because the engines are not running we check the compartment selector temperature selector is on auto so you can see these are all on auto so that's good we check the parking brake is on so you can see the parking brake is pulled so that means it's on and if you're gonna take a look over here on the parking brake indicator you can see there is pressure 2000 so check the accumulator pressure we have it as nearly in the green recharge if necessary it must be in the green band and if required use the electric pump mptu on the hydraulic system to recharge the brakes accumulation i'm going to show you that in a second then we check that the parking brake pressure is more than 1500 psi and we have 2000 so we're good Alternate braking, alternate braking system we have um, this one over here, there's a little problem chocks are not simulated in Microsoft Flight Simulator so when you put the chocks it actually uses the parking brake so to perform this test we need to remove the chocks otherwise the test won't work so chocks we pretend they're in place braking, uh, brake anti-skid alternate on parking brake off so we're gonna turn the parking brake off we apply maximum pressure on the brake pedals let's see if I can show you you can see the brake pedals over here with maximum pressure on the brake pressure tip, triple indicator pressure must build up symmetrically without delay on left and right sides and we have it brake pedals released and there we go. So the purpose of this test is the uh, alternate braking system and the normal braking system are on two different hydraulic circuits. The normal braking system is on the green hydraulic system. The alternate is on the yellow. This indicator only shows the yellow hydraulic system pressure for brakes. So it moves when you're using the alternate system but it should not move once you use the normal braking system because that's commanded by the green hydraulic system. As you can see, the engines are on, are off at the moment, so we're not generating pressure for the brakes. So every time we use the brakes, we are actually depleting the accumulator. So if you play around with this test, at the end, with the accumulator pressure at zero, you won't be able to set the parking brake. You see, I pulled the parking brake, but there is no brake pressure because we didn't have any more accumulator. So what we're going to do, we're going to start the electric pump as the FCOM was mentioning. So let's bring up the hydraulic systems. So you can see here, green and yellow. If we go on the overhead, over here we have the green electric pump. We start that one and we can see green hydraulic system pressure building up but then as we said we need the yellow one so we're gonna go up again activate the power transfer unit and now it's gonna transfer power to the yellow system once this one reaches 3000 you see the accumulator pressure will go up there we go so accumulator is recharged so we can turn these off and we're good perfect next check Make sure we put this one back to normal. The parking brake is on. We have pressure. We're good. We check that the speed brake handle is retracted and disarmed. So retracted is it is because it's on top and then disarmed when it's lowered. And if it's lifted, it means it's armed. Slats flaps handle. We check that it matches and it agrees with the indicator so the indicator over here is showing slat zero flap zero and the handle is on zero and zero so we're good with slats and flaps move on to the next page and we're gonna start the overhead so the fcom says it is a general rule to extinguish all white lights for all systems during the scan sequence 
these actions are therefore not listed here. So white lights are these. So these need to be turned off even if the FCOM doesn't tell you. Uh, the only caveat there is the uh, fuel pumps that we can leave off until later. So let's start from the top. We're going to check gear pins and covers. So this is before the overhead. They will be stored somewhere in the cockpit uh, and we will check those. But at the moment, I mean, they're not simulated, so you can't see them. So now we can start with the overhead panel. We start with the IRS one, two, three in NAV. So this view probably is a little easier. So IRS are here on top of the overhead. We're going to set one to NAV, the second one here to NAV, and the last one to NAV. Before we continue with the rest of the panel, the IRS on the A300 do not start aligning uh, if we haven't done the initialization in the FMS. So we need to do that straight away. So you can see down the page it says FMS CDU init key. So we're going to go to the CDU. We are already on the init page and we just need to enter the latitude and the longitude. To do that, we can either enter the pair of airports. So today is Echo Golf Kilo Kilo to Lima Echo India Bravo. If you have a Simbri flight plan, it can fetch that automatically. But also the other option, so that will be already here. The other option is also to go menu, acres, request Simbrief, and that will populate it in the same way. At this point, you have latitude and longitude. All that is left to do is to press align IRS. Perfect. We don't do anything else here at the moment. That's just to align the IRS. If we go back on the overhead, now we can see that if you switch to heading status, we have seven, which means seven minutes to align uh, before we wouldn't have had any indication. So now we know they started the process of, of alignment. And uh, the FCOM says check valid coordinates have been sent. The coordinates will not show until the alignment is complete, so we'll check that later on. Now let's start the actual proper scan of the overhead panel. The way we do it traditionally, we do it panel by panel, starting from the left, going up, two, three, four, and five panels. So let's start from here. Cabin signs, no smoking, auto. Seat belt on, but not yet, because we need to have finished refueling before we can put the seat belts on, so we leave it there um, off for now. Coals, we check that coal is extinguished. So here you will have all your coals. There's nothing highlighted over here, so it's good. Hydraulic power, we check that the blue, green, and yellow reservoirs are within normal range. So the needle should be in the outer green part, and it is for all three systems. Then we check the flight recorder. Ground control is on. So this one makes sure that all the conversations in the copy are recorded onto the uh, flight recorder, so or AKA, um, AKA black box. And then we check that the uh, two lights over here the DFDR and the FDAU lights are extinguished. So this one over here. We check that the ISDU is set to off. Don't know for what reason, but we'll put it off. And that's the first panel. Then we move on to second panel over here. Start with the lights. So we have the strobe auto, the beacon we check that is off. And it's not written in the FCOM, but we also put the nav light to on. One or two, doesn't matter. That's just two different systems. We check pitch, trim, yo, damper, and ATS. We start all the systems, but pitch, trim, we won't be able to start it now because it doesn't stay on unless the IRS has finished the alignment. So we'll come back to that later. White light, we don't need to be told, 
so we extinguish that by pressing the push button next step next page is engine one fire we do the same test as we did for the apu so these two buttons are in press script test observe the two script lights and then press the actual test we have loop a loop b the handle and the crc perfect nothing to do here move on to the next panel we need to check that the fuel crossfeed is in line no sorry first actually fuel crossfeed cross line it says and that's cross so it's not in line with the diagram we check that the isolation valves and uh, low pressure valves so over here are so low pressure valves over here and isolation valves are all in line and they are we're going to press the crossfit valve and check that it turns in line and then press it again and it goes again cross line then landing gear annunciator we check normal indications so you have two down locked and three green lights and it says cross check with the center instrument panel and here we have as well three green lights so that's all good then cockpit voice recorder you can see here there's a tiny needle i'm not sure you'll be able to see it but if we do the test we can see this needle moving all the way to the green good part and that's good move on to the next panel over to the right as we said we're leaving the fuel pumps off next one over we have uh let's see if i can find it there we go cabin pressure auto pressure rate limit knob normal so you can see here it's on normal is at the 12 12 o'clock position then rate light is extinguished that will be here we're checking the cabin altitude differential pressure and cabin vertical speed for logical indication with a sea level so zero zero and zero so that's good crew oxygen we check the system high pressure which is not modeled over here it's actually here in the cargo version of the a300 but not the passenger and then we check the uh, low pressure system over here it's in the green then we're going to check the engine 2 fire protection so squib 1 and 2 loop a loop b the handle and the crc perfect move on to the last panel and we check in emergency exit light armed so over here we move it to armed just one notch up cockpit temperature we check econ flow now this is needed only if you have less than 160 passengers so it will use less lead air while this one max cool as required it says again this is needed only for very hot or humid airports then the compartment temperature selector to auto as we said all of them to auto and they automatically regulate the temperature and then we check the, the uh, this knob over here in it's in the crt position this is because the a300 was very much an experiment of uh, starting to use computer screens so it does have your ecom screens over here but they weren't quite sure they could trust them yet so every system that is modeled here has as well a um, an equivalent um, in the cockpit with steam gauges so for example if we put the aircon page here you can see all the temperatures of the different compartments but here we have a backup so if that um, screen wasn't working we could check the temperature over here but unfortunately when you check it over here it then blanks the indication you can see here the orange x it blanks the indication on the camera so to make sure you see everything um, on the screen you just need to make sure that this one is in the crt position perfect once that is done 
we would tune the VHF com frequencies for ATC. Today we're not going to be on that, so we're not going to use ATC, so we're not going to do that. But if you were using ATC here, you would set all your frequencies. Airfield data will obtain necessary data for system initialization and copy preparation. So we're going to go here and go on to my flight. We can import from the scene brief and it's going to fetch automatically the meter from the departure and destination airport. And then lastly, load sheet will insert uh, zero field weight, field on board and everything else. So we can go on the weight and balance. Here is quite easy. We can update from the scene brief rather than populate uh, everything individually. And then we apply the load to aircraft. All we're gonna do is just to make sure that it got it right. So let's check on our scene brief plan. We're supposed to have a zero field weight of one, one, one decimal, well, one rounded up. And we have one, one, one decimal seven, so that's a little bit higher for some reason. That's fine, 500 kilos are not gonna make much of a difference. We then have block fuel 16.68, and that's exactly what we requested. And the takeoff weight is going to be 127 decimal 9. Here is saying 126 decimal 738. So I guess the. This must be slightly different, the pro, uh, slightly wrong, the profile I have on scene brief. So takeoff weight is actually going to be a bit higher. So let's see if we can change here the zero for weight no it's still changing it's fine the work that little that one extra ton is not gonna make that much difference so we're fine perfect weights are entered And let's go back to our FCOM. Move to the next page. And we're going to start with FMS initialization. So if the message please wait uh, appears, it's not there. So we don't worry about that. We're going to start checking the FMS database validity. So press ref key and display aircraft status page. Today is the 27th of January and the database is active from today, it's just changed until the 22nd of February, so the database is correct. The performance factor is 0.0, .0 so we haven't uh, applied any changes on the same brief, so that matches. Flight plan initialization, we press the init key, we check the, the city per code is correct, in GKK lab, that's been entered, we check and modify the alternate, and that is correct. Uh, Lima Echo Bravo Lima. We enter the flight number. So let's have a look at our Simbri flight plan. Flight number today is going to be Dan Air 135. And we enter the cost index while we're there. And that's 50. Perfect. Uh, enter the intended cruise flight level and that's already there 350 we enter the tropopause altitude and this one that's a little bit weird because it does enter the winds so if we have a look at again at the simbri flight plan it has fetched the winds which are uh, 292 at 40 but it hasn't fetched the uh, temperature. Now here you can see because the LIDO uh, format of the flight plan doesn't show it, but I've generated it in the easy jet version as well that gives uh, the temperature in the tropopause. So the temperature will be minus 59 and we're gonna enter that. And then the tropopause is 39953. There we go. So that's all entered. Let's go back to the FCOM. Flight plan A page complete and check. So the crew must check, modify or insert the flight plan. That's already been done automatically. Otherwise, we would have to go on the flight plan page and enter every single waypoint. But being a medium to long haul aircraft, it's very 
very handy to just load the simply fry plan all you're gonna have to do you're gonna be left to do is to enter the um, departure the, 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 the departure airport runway and then the sit and the transaction so as you can see on the top right of the FCOM so we're gonna enter the lateral revision we're gonna press on the airports press sit and then select our departure here we'll check it on Navigraph we are departing from runway 26 left so let's have a look at that there's going to be 26 left by the Bogna 1 X-ray departure no transaction so we can insert that one and then we'll do the same with the arrival so we scroll all the way down to leap, press there, star, we're going to select ILS Z06, so ILS Zulu 06, and it's going to be a chord 3 Victor arrival with a transition at DMF. Perfect. Now we'll insert that. And now we are going to check that that makes sense, that it matches the um, what we see on Navigraph. So let's do that. Have a look here. FCU, we put this one to plan. And we can leave it on 15. At this point, we can see, have a look together at the ND and the FCU. So... At this point, once we start scrolling, so we scroll pressing the button and then the button uh, with the arrow going up as if it, we were moving a piece of paper. So we can start following here that everything makes sense. We check that there are no discontinuities, that the white line is in uninterrupted and it goes all the way to the arrival with the start and the approach. So that's all good, perfect matches. So next up, check uh, flight plan uh, flight plan B page. So here we will check the winds, but at the moment that's not simulated, so we cannot enter them. So we leave it, but it's okay because we have the average wind that we put on the init page, so that should give already enough uh, enough data. Then secondary flight plan, we click on secondary flight plan, copy the active, and then as the FCOM says, we copy the active flight plan but modify it at a suitable waypoint for an immediate return. Now this is not possible to do, uh, we normally do it on the A320, you have the option, you click on any waypoint and route, and then there is an option to select a, a new destination while there isn't one here so the way to do it we're just going to go on secondary flight plan and here on the secondary index we just change to EGKK going to EGKK so we're planning a return straight away at the same airport and this is just in case of an engine failure so we enter that and then we're gonna go and modify, click on secondary flight plan. At this point, we have just Gatwick as a departure and an arrival. We put the same departure as the main flight plan. So we just put two six left. It's already selected, so we don't need to do anything. And we just put insert. At this point though, we're gonna modify it. As it says as well on the FCOM, it actually says it here. So at a suitable waypoint, as we said, for an immediate return to the departure airfield, so immediate, so we can have a look. Let's see if you can visualize again everything there. Perfect. If we scroll it, I would say that at Kilo Kilo Sierra 17 we can turn back. So we delete the few points after that. Then we can create ourselves a, also a custom waypoint if we want to do the whole procedure in NAV instead of having to direct ourselves even though ATC will be directing us but it's always good to have a backup plan 
we create a, a custom waypoint. So we can start by using this one as a reference, Kilo Kilo Sierra 17. We put a slash and then the um, heading will be taken from there, which is um, the opposite of the part that I on this runway is 257, but you can check it on Navigraph if you're in doubt. So we're starting from 26 left, which is over here. So the reciprocal is going to be here, and that's going to be 077. So we enter 077, and then put, I don't know, 25 miles, and put it after this waypoint. That's been generated there. There we go. So we see we go that way. It's even too even too much, 25 miles, but it's fine. And then we can turn and go direct to the approach. We can select. Ah, oh no, it's not too much because we haven't selected the approach yet. So we're going to be okay. We select the approach, star, ILS, 26 left, no star, insert that. And perfect. Yeah, that looks all right. So the second effort plan is done. Now let's get the F command again. Progress page. Check the view are, are tuned by the FMS and modify if required. View are as already are already tuned. We don't need to modify. This is entirely RNAV departure. Uh, but if we had any VORs on the departure, we could hard tune them here just by entering the three letters identifier. You can just type it and put it there. And you choose which is the correct one. There we go. That point that will be hard tuned. Now, also it's not in the FCOM, but here on the very distance we'll put the landing runway for an immediate return again for the situational awareness. So gap to two six left. Put it there, and now we have a bearing and distance. Perfect. Next page. FMS gross weight insertion. So we're gonna go on the init page. Go on next page, that's the init B. So zero fill weight CG and zero fill weight. We're going to insert those. We can check them from the plan over here, from the weight and balance, or we can simply click here and it will auto populate it. So 111.2, that's an odd one because here is 111.7, so it is getting it right. But anyway, 111.2 matches the flight plan. 0 fuel 8 CG, strangely, it doesn't do it automatically. It gives entry out of range, so we need to actually fetch it from there. We're going to go and have a look. And we have max zero fuel weight is 28. So we enter that here. Then we just need the block fuel, which we can check here if we cancel this warning over here so clear and here we can see 16.7 so we enter 16.7 block fuel and we have the takeoff weight and the landing weight populated now if we have a look at scene brief we can double check all that data takeoff weight 127 decimal 5 here estimated is 126.7, you said there was a little discrepancy, but we're okay with that. And then the landing weight should be 117.6. That one, unfortunately, ignore it because the uh, calculation of the fuel at the moment is way off on the inner build. Um, it isn't a problem because it sorts itself out as you fly. So, in brief, here it tells us we're going to be using nine tons. Um, of fuel but here it says 10.8 so it doesn't give us any extra fuel and it will never give you extra fuel because it always grossly overestimates the consumption but it is very accurate it actually works out well once it's in the cruise it resets and it normally matches what's on scene brief so ignore that at this point it doesn't make much sense to enter these um, this data but hopefully they will fix it and we'll show you how to do that the on the operational flight plan we have contingency which is 1.2 which is your reserve so you would enter that here again at the moment 
little bug and it doesn't stay it resets itself but that's what you would do you would put it here to have then accurate calculations the alternate is 3.3 .3, not 2.7 so we put 3.3 .3. here we don't need to put a slash because there isn't one here so the format is just a number and then the final final reserve here on the plan says 2.1 instead of 2.2 .2, so we enter that 2.1 slash and there we go and ideally you will want to see at least 100 kilos of extra um, uh, but definitely not um, not it doesn't show minus the a320 is a lot more clever because it tells you that you have missing fuel while here it doesn't it only says zero um, so again um, something that you really need to double check um, because it might be uh, way below what you need but it will still show zero but that is done can continue with the next step so the block fuel that's all been entered fms takeoff data insertion what we're going to do so um, one thing one last thing you would check here is that your optimal the cruise level is close to the optimal flight level so the optimal is 348 we're cruising at 350 that's bang on uh if it was particularly the, the cruise level was a lot lower than the optimal flight level you would need to check why um, normally it's because it's a short flight and you cannot get to the optimal flight level uh, but if it's a very long flight and these two don't match you might need to change your flight plan now the next one is fms takeoff data insertion so on the efb we're going to go and do the takeoff performance calculation so go on to performance we're going to go and select the correct runway which is 26 left press the sync button to fetch the weather wait one two seven decimal nine yep and then we calculate now to calculate the um, flaps configuration all we do is we check we start with the highest flap um, configuration and by highest I mean the least flaps 15 0 means only the slats are out and the flaps are not we calculate and we say 58 now we check the next one up the next one for the next one to be worth using because if you have more flaps out you're using a little bit more fuel because you have more drag according to the FCOM there needs to be at least a 5 degrees gain on the flex temperature so the higher the temperature the more derated the engines are so the more you extend the life of the engines so you calculate that and see what that does this gives us now 63 it's five degrees difference so it's worth using 1515 if we try 1520 it stays on 63 so that's not worth it so we're going to do 1515 recalculate it and then we have the speeds so 144 144 is v1 and vr we're going to enter that onto the takeoff page 144 and 144 v2 it cannot be inserted here it needs to be inserted on the fcu so if now we have the alignment complete which we should so if we go and check here on the overhead perfect we have the coordinates so we are aligned so at this point we can turn the pitch trim on and now we can use the fc the fcu otherwise this would be all blank so we can enter the speed on the v2 over here 147 we can enter it there there we go then the fcom says we need to enter a thrust reduction and acceleration which is a thousand feet but it's either certain airlines do 1000 certain airlines do 1500 i commonly do 1000 so i'm going to go and check the um altitude airport altitude which is a case 200 i know but there we go 203 so what we're going to do we're going to enter one 
1203 on the thrust reduction 1203 on the acceleration unless you were doing an NADP2 noise abatement procedure in which case you would put 3000 feet above airfield for the acceleration engine out acceleration we're going to do the same so I don't want to do any DP2 so we'll leave that there and then we change the other two and these could be changing if your airline had the specific engine out procedure for that um, airport so that's all done we have thrust reduction acceleration now we're going to do the glare shield we check the PFD NND brightness which you can change over here again it's day so we're fine with full brightness we check the FPV so the flight path vector is um, not on so we have uh, just the flight director if we turn it up we will get the flight path vector and down we have nothing so we put it back to on and we have our flight directors we're then going to check the VOR Navo ILS we're using what is relevant today ILS is only for approach NAV is if we're using what comes out of the FMC so our flight plan and VOR is if we were doing um, navigation old school navigation with VOR station so we leave it to NAV if is control box as required so on the if is we would for departure activate constraint to check our speed and altitude constraints on the plan and the modem range it says it is recommended to use map mode for takeoff so map mode unless the city is not in the database then PF should use R code rows but we are using the FMS so map mode and we're gonna put 15 minimum range to display all the first waypoints while on the P and F while not flying we'll put 60 to see a little bit more of what's ahead then FCU we adjust the brightness if needed with this knob over here speed mac setting knob we select v2 as we did then we push to activate preset when you push the button over here like this you can see preset now preset is to preset the climb altitude now the a320 is more clever than the a300 so it does that automatically but the A300 knows the climb altitude only if it's using FMS data. So as long as you're departing on NAV, so following your flight plan, the plane knows that it will have to accelerate at a certain speed once it reaches the acceleration altitude, so 1,200 in our case. But if you were to depart on vectors, so instead of using NAV, you were using heading, at that point the plane would not know which speed to set after V2, after the acceleration altitude. So we need to tell it. So we're going to set. In this case for today, the procedure that we're flying is actually, if we have a look at Navigraph, there is a restriction of 220. There we go. So we can set 220. Now, once you set it, don't be tempted, don't click it again. You cannot go back to visualizing V2. Once you click it again, it cancels the preset. So at that point, it wouldn't know that it needs to climb. So leave it illuminated and at the value that you need. 220, don't worry, the 147 has not disappeared. You can still see it here on the PFD. 147 is still set. That's all done. Then uh, altitude, um, altitude selection, initial uh, cleared altitude. So in this case, as per charts, it's 5000. Heading selector, um, we can set it. There is a way as well to align it. So once you align on the run, we could just simply press this one. So I'll show you once you press it automatically aligns with the heading uh, but 
it's fine, it's good practice, just to put it there, we know it's going to be 257, we'll leave it there. We can also pre-activate, we're going to depart on nav and profile, so we can select those already. So we're going to have here a vertical speed, heading, that's how we take off, but then we're going to turn onto profile climb and nav. So that's all done. Oxygen mask, which are going to test the oxygen flow, it's over here, actually it doesn't make any noise. So you can push the button, but it's, it's oh no, it does here. This one it does. So we can do the two tests, this one and this one. Then we can check the GPWS that the lights over here are not illuminated. So that's all good. Then ND we check for correct display. So I'm going to check the ND. Nothing unusual. We check that the ground speed, initial waypoint, VOR indication, we have everything we need. We check the standby speed indicator over here is um, zero. And then we check the PFD for correct display. Sorry, ND over here, PFD, everything is good. Perfect, next page. Check the VA side, so the vertical speed indicator is on zero, that makes sense. Altimeters, there's no flag and we set to Q&H. So we can check the Q&H over here, go back to my flight, refresh it, Gatwick at the moment 1031, so we can either set it manually, so it's the one on the right and it's the one on the left on the standby, 1031, or we can just be in the Microsoft Flight Simulator, press the B on the keyboard and this will set automatically. Once it's set, we also check that it makes sense. It's showing 210, and we knew it was 203, so that's correct, and it matches. We're going to check the clock is correct, and the time is right, so 12, uh, 24, and that's correct. Then central instrument panel, standby altimeter, we check no flags, we check the QNH is set. Standby horizon, we check there is no flag, and we erect. We don't need to hold it, it does everything automatically. Ecom, we press recall, which is over here. And we check there's nothing that we are not expecting. So the mid cabin not closed, we can close it to get rid of that. There we go, takes a second and then boom. So that's all good. In the chat, brake anti-skid is on normal. Engine instruments, we check that the oil pressure is zero. So the oil pressure is this indicator over here, the top one, and that's on zero. Oil quantity, minimum quantity is 10 quarts plus the estimated consumption. We have around about 17 quarts, uh, left and right, so that's good. Then we check fuel flow is zero. We check N2, and at the moment is zero. We check the EGT makes sense, which it doesn't. So I guess that again is a slight bug mistake because it's showing 86 degrees centigrade while it's actually five degrees outside. That is fine, nothing to worry about. And then the N1 is on zero. We also check the reverse um, rev and rev unlocked. So it's the reverse and reverse and unlocked lights are extinguished. You can see them here for both engines. We're going to go on uh, thrust rating panel, which is here. We're going to either select toga or flex. So in this case, we need to do flex. We said we were doing 63 degrees. And we set 63 degrees. Then TAT, the outside temperature, makes sense. That's six degrees. And the thrust limit bugs correspond to the thrust limit display. So this is 93.6. 6 and the bugs here are the same 93.6 we're gonna check the landing gear panel we can do the test there we are position can be either one or two doesn't really matter and then we're gonna set the landing elevation to the departure field elevation so in this case again 200 feet Then pedestal, 
So we're going to check the ADF. We don't need it, so we don't need to tune it. Radius, we check that the in knob, so the intercom knob, is out. So we check that it's raised up, and we bring the volume up, and we also press this one down. So this is what we receive, this is what we send. So this is to communicate with the ground crew. So it's not really simulated in the sim, but we're still going to do it. Then we're going to check the VHF transmission and um, reception. So, yeah, we are rece receiving from VHF1 and transmitting on VHF1. HF, we leave it off. We don't need it. And if you ever need it, which I don't think is simulated in Microsoft Flight Simulator, but it would be over here. Point we check the weather radar is off. So the weather radar panel is here. It's off with this switch in the center position off. We check the parking brake is off if we had the chocks, but we don't have them. So at the moment we have it on. We will check ATC is on standby. So we uh, ATC is on standby and TCAS is the same. They're connected. We also check that this is above. And over here you can see altitude reporting is on one. So we're good. Then next one up we have VOR ILS course frequency so you could also set an ILS if you needed it. Uh, for example we could set if we wanted to the return just in case we wanted to return we can go and pick the charts for Gatwick approach ILS 26 left we have 110.9 we can set that and the course is 257 Perfect. Now that's all done. Uh, FMS data confirmation. That would be a, well in a two pilot environment. So you can go and recheck your data. We won't do that to save some time. FMS flight plan. Again, we would double check the FMS flight plan as we did before. Airfield data we can confirm and we have it. Flight recorder, we recheck that the DFDR and DFDAU lights are extinguished. So we go up on the overhead, lights are extinguished. We're going to check the fuel quantity. Fuel has been done, so we can turn the seat belts on. And we're going to check the fuel quantity. So over here we have 16.7. Double check always with your flight plan. 16.7, and we have 16.7 indicated. You can also check on the fuel page and we have 16.6 .6 over here rounded slightly different and it's balanced perfect let's go back to the fcom and fuel pumps at this point they can go on all the fuel pumps are on even center tank regardless of whether you have fuel in the center tank or not we will do now a takeoff briefing. N not gonna do exactly as it says here. We're just gonna check something quick. We're gonna check the init page. We are Gatwick to Ibiza. That's correct. So cost industry is gonna be five zero, cruise level three five zero, and we are Danair one three five. Flight plan, we're departing from runway two six left. So we are at stand three two over here so to taxi to 26 left we're expecting to push back facing west so facing nose facing left we'll uh, and taxi via Kilo Papa Alpha Sierra onto uh, holding point Alpha for only 26 left the runway is 3300 meters so plus uh, 1515 is more than enough the speeds are going to be 144, 144, 147 we have it set up and the accelerated altitude is 1200 and also check our msa is 2000 so we're not really gonna 2100 here we're not really gonna worry about that sorry yeah that's all good perfect 
That's it. So let's start the APU. Actually, probably better to start the APU before doing the briefing because it takes a little while to spool up. But we'll do that now. So the switch goes up to the on position and then we press the push button, the start push button. If you want to monitor the start, as long as you do not keep any of these uh, lit, the account is clever, not as clever as the A320, but it does bring up the page that you need at that point. Let's turn pages on the FCOM. Take off data, prepare and check, revise. So that's all been done, so we don't need to revise. There's no change of runway or anything else. Seat, C belts, harness, rudder and pedals adjust. Then we have CDU in takeoff configuration, which means the pilot not flying. Select flight plan, we're here. And while the pilot flying, select the takeoff page. APU is coming up. Hopefully. Yeah, 87%. The generator is starting to power now. Once it's in the green, we are on APU generator. There we go. Everything is in the green, so now we can turn the external power off. We can ask the ground crew to disconnect the ground power unit. While we're at it, we can arm the doors. And we can do the before start checklist down to the line. So go to my flight, checklist, and we can do the before start checklist. Copy preparation has been completed. Fuel quantity we checked is 16.7. Takeoff data have been um, set. So this one you'll check your QNH primarily. So 1031 on all three altimeters, and we're showing 200 feet. Land elevation has been set and it's 200 altimeters set. Brake anti skid is normal and on over here. And then we have windows and doors closed. The windows are not simulated, so they're definitely closed. And the, with the doors you can see here the slides are armed and all the doors are closed. So before takeoff checklist to the line complete. Move on to the right column, pushback and startup clearance. So we're going to request that. IFGSX, so we're going to do that here. Again, windows and doors, we check that they're closed. Cockpit door toggle switch locked, then normal. So that will be up here. All the way up. Lock and then normal. Beacon goes to on over here because switch ATC goes to on and TCAS goes to alt off or TRA um, TRA in the States but we're in Europe here so we're gonna put expander for now which is the alt off equivalent APU bleed on normally we wait one or two minutes for the APU to stabilize and uh, the um, seals to do the jobs here we, we, and I say I, I have forgotten to extinguish this light, so probe heat and window heater should go on now. So no white lights. We can double check that there's no white lights anywhere. At this point, we check APU bleed. So as you can see now, there is no line here. It's actually considering that the engine bleeds are used with the lines, the flow bar over here, while why when, when we activate the APU bleed, we're going to see that's what provides the APU bleed and also the cross feed goes on to line. So the APU bleed duct is on the left, so the cross feed needs to activate to provide air to the right engine. You can see here in the indication for pressure. We said that we're going to go nose to the left and that's it. Perfect. So before start checklist below the line, beacon is on, parking brake will be off in a second. So if pushback required, release the parking brake. Do not, do not use 
brakes during pushback unless required due to an emergency. So we're gonna release the parking brake and we start the PNF clock. So over here to the side, we start the clock. This little, I don't know if I can show, there we go. This one over here, we set it to run. Perfect. So we now have pushback. Move on to engine start. So throttle levers idle. They are on idle, which is double check. Ignition start AOB. We're gonna set ignition to B. And then we follow the procedure as it is described on the FCOM. So make sure that the engine page is visualized over here. I'm gonna start engine 2, we press start, check the valve is open, and check indication, N2 is rising, oil pressure is rising, with a minimum, minimum of 15, but ideally more maximum motoring rotation, which is around 24-25, we then go and introduce the fuel. So 24, perfect. So we introduce the fuel, we start the chrono, we observe fuel flow, so you can see this has gone up just a little bit, but it is up. We just check EGT rising, N1 rotating. When N2 is at 45, check on the overhead and we have valve closed. We monitor the EGT. 430 and that's good now we can start engine number one reset the chrono before we do that there we go starting engine number one valve open and two oil pressure now let's see what happens what I said we wait for 24 let's see what happens if we do a 15 the reason why I wait 24 is because if you introduce fuel at 15 you can see EGT N1 and you will see that the earlier you introduce fuel the, the, the hotter the start so for engine 2, it stopped at 4.30, and while here it keeps going up. All the way to nearly 600. Well, that's why normally I wait for 24. There we go. We have all parameters correct. Everything here is in the green. EGT stayed within limits. We check that they settle it says here at the bottom of the left column on the FCOM, it says that ISA N1 about 24, which it is, N2 about 50, sorry, 58, and it's 63, a little higher, EGT about 400, and fuel flow about 600, which it is difficult to see, but yeah, it's around 500, 600. Normally, I just remember 24466. Six which it makes it easier, so 2, 4, 4, 6, 6, and that's it. ECAM, we check the secondary parameters, everything is okay, and the oil quantity after the second engine start should be below 20 quarts, and it is decreased a little bit, it was 17 before engine start, and now it's 15, as the oil, of course, is circulating now, so that's perfect. Move on to the next page. set the parking brake because probably ground crew has been waiting a while while we were having fun with the engines ignition can go off so we come here ignition will go off APU bleed off over here APU master off engine warm up we need three minutes so now we start the chrono 
for the engine warmer. We check engine anti ice. It's not needed. We are within the right temperature for engine anti ice, but there is no humidity. So below 10 degrees TAT, if there is visible humidity, clouds, low clouds, fog, rain, or um, snow, we would use the engine anti, -ice, anti ice, which is over here, and we don't need it. Wing anti ice, the same, we don't need it. Slats and flaps, we set for takeoff. We said that we need it 15 15. So we're going to set 15 15. One notch and two notches. Ground spoiler arm, so we click on it and that's armed. Aileron trim and rudder trim. Rudder trim is here, zero. Aileron trim is zero. This is horizontal. And then we check pitch trim set for takeoff. Pitch trim for takeoff, we'll check it here. Back on to the takeoff performance. Zero point zero down. Let's see if we can see here. It's at the moment on one up, so we move it to zero point zero. Perfect. Ecom, we check the status. So click on status. It's normal. Ecom door page, we select the door page and we check all the doors are closed and the slides are armed. Clear the disconnect. Announce at this point, Grand Crew would have disconnected. Yeah, they're all gone. One thing that we missed is to check that they were showing the pin, but we know they did because it's a sim. And, um,. Next one is after start checklist. So let's go and get the checklist. After start checklist, pitch trim has been set to zero. Rather trim is zero. Spoilers is spoilers are armed. Slats and flaps we have 1515 15 and we're showing 1515 15 over here on the center panel indicator. Ecom status has been checked, anti ice not required, hand signal received. After start checklist complete. And now we move on to taxi phase. Now, nose light, taxi. There we go. Taxi clearance obtained, we've been asked for taxi clearance. We would select parking brake off and check that the brake pressure over here falls to zero. We will start elapsed time. So here we start the timer over here. The chrono is still going, but we can start the timer. It will run in the background and then we'll come up once we reset the chrono. A stereo lights as required. Depending on your airline, you can use the runway turn off or not. We're going to put them on now. Thrust lever. In order to get the aircraft moving, we need a little bit of thrust, not much. On the apron, never more than 30%. Anyway. One thing we're going to do now, because then it's single pilot and it's going to be difficult to do it while we move, we're going to do the flight control check, which is on the right side of this page of the FCOM. So we're going to select flight control page and we're going to visualize that the controls so we do pull left pull right neutral pull up pull down neutral and rudder pull left pull right neutral and blank the flight control page perfect so we can start taxing We do a brake check, so we dump the brakes and we check that the pressure doesn't rise, which means we're on the correct hydraulic system. Perfect, so brake check, pressure zero.
then ADC clearance obtain confirm take off data condition this is only and exclusively if you had a change of uh, runway or a change of intersection and you needed to recalculate everything and reset the FCU and etc but we haven't done that we check flight instruments scan instruments panel observed no abnormal flag on instruments so we check everything makes sense we activate with start the uh, radar so radar on and select tilt at four degrees up for takeoff let's make this turn and then you can do we can do that Okay, radar. We put it in system one, so that means it's on, and then we select four degrees up. Actually, four degrees doesn't really, uh, it's not an option, it's either three or four and a half because it works not continuous but in larger notches, but it's fine. EGPWS, terrain on ND, if we needed it, we would press terrain on ND. It's not a simulator at the moment, so we're not going to put it on. And definitely around London, you don't need terrain awareness. Take off config test push button, we press it's over here. We press it, hold it for three seconds. And take off test is normal, so that means that flight configuration is good and we don't have anything weird going on. We would do at this point a takeoff briefing. So we can read what it says here. Take off runway 26 left. Actually it isn't. It says that it's on the takeoff birth page, but it isn't you can check it on the flight plan page. So flight plan, runway 26 left. Weight is 127.7, so we can check it against your operational flight plan. The slats and flaps is 15, 15. We can check the indicator and the handle. Fuel is 16.4, which matches what we had on the plan. Um, flex is 63 and N1 is going to be 93.6. Speeds, we check them on the takeoff performance page 144, 144, 147. We have 147 set here. And then we have initial clear altitude is 5000 showing on the PFD and on the FCU. Okay, ECAM is normal for takeoff. There's nothing, there's no blue. And then uh, before takeoff, checklist down to the line complete. So we'll do that before we get to the runway. Before takeoff, checklist frequent controls, we check them. Flight instruments have been checked again. Briefing is confirmed. Speeds were 144, 144, 147. Flex temp is 63. Slats and flats 15 15 and takeoff config is normal for takeoff. There we go. So we stop just short of the runway and we finish the last page. There we go. Set the brakes. So we will require request takeoff or lineup clearance. Check that the approach path is clear of traffic. We check visually and we check that we don't have anything on TCAS. Coming crew, we would advise which, with, with ever, whichever system your airline uses. On and off seatbelts is good enough. Brake yellow hydraulic pressure. We check that, well, technically, without the parking brake. We don't have hydraulic pressure over there. Brake temperature is within limits, so below 150, and we have 10. Brake fan is off. Auto brake max. So over here, auto brake goes to max. Ignition continue relight if there is standing water or heavy rain or severe turbulence. So 
not the case today. Pack valves, we could select packs off if we needed increase increase performance. So in this case we could select packs off, but we don't need it. Once when you're doing a flex takeoff instead of a toga takeoff, the packs off actually do not increase performance, but they reduce the EGT, the temperature of the engines, so extends the life of the engines. But a single pilot will have enough to do during takeoff without having to put those back on. So we leave them on. ATC on. So we're going to go here and turn this one to TARA. Check that it's on. Either one or two. One if the captain is flying. Two if the first officer is flying. QF, uh, external lights. We turn on everything that we need, which is strobe. Nose goes to take off. The landing lights go to on and the runway turn off are on. QFU and threshold we confirm. So QFU, you're checking the actual QFU is the heading of the runway. So we're checking that they make sense. Now at the moment we are facing 0, 090 0 degrees, but of course we're turning around so. It makes sense that we're starting on runway 26 left. Before takeoff checklist below the line, we have transponder is set, TCAS is TARA, auto brake is max, and ignition is off. So before takeoff checklist below the line completed. There we go, line up, come to a stop. And voila, so for takeoff, it's always a good habit to rehearse this before taking off because it's a very high workload phase. But I'll leave that to you and we'll just get going. The one thing I normally don't do is as soon as we turn the landing gear, we put the landing gear up. Here it says to put this, uh, disarm the ground spoilers and to set the stereo lights off. But I normally delay that um, uh, because, of course, it's a one pilot environment, so you need to you need to choose your battles. So the engines are warmed up. We need it three minutes. That's been 13 minutes, so we can click once to stop and twice to reset. We have now the time here that is running, the block time. We're going to reset, restart the chrono now as soon as we um, um, take off or the time limit for engines at Toga. So if you had a, a, an engine failure, you would then push for Toga on the remaining engine and you have a time limit on Toga, which is five to 10 minutes, depending on the engines and the plane. So we're gonna go through takeoff, start the clock, Intermediate thrust setting stabilize at 40. I'm gonna put 60 because I have a detent on my hardware. Normally you do 40. Then we press Toga, which is this button over here, not on the real plane. This is just a little cheat button um, to be able to press it while you're looking down the runway. Then we use the rudder pedals, announce the FMA, 100 knots, we check, and then we rotate. Perfect. So, stabilize the engines. Press Toga, start the chrono, hold the control column down half, we check before 80 knots, take off thrust is set and it is set, hold the center line, at 80 knots we start releasing the pressure on the control column, 100 knots, checked. V1, 
rotate. Start rotating, get to 15 degrees within about 5 seconds. Positive climb, we can see the indicator here, gear up, and then we settle on to the flight directors. Trim, I know it's an Airbus, but this one needs to be trimmed. We trim onto the flight directors. We wait for acceleration altitude, which we said it was going to be 1200. At this point, you can see climb over here. We have profile thrust, profile climb, nav. We're in nav, so we're following the profile. We are now above F speed for flaps, so we can put the flaps to zero and keep the slats out. To make things easier, we activate the autopilot. We're passing now S speed, so slats retract, speed checked, and the slats are retracting. Now we can do the actions over here, so ground spoiler disarmed, lights go off, everything can go off, we're in Europe, now in the States, 1000 feet to go. It's going to level off at 5,000. You can see here the constraint, 5,000. And it is following the 220 because it's programmed in the FMS. So we know we see the blue 220 bug. And we can see here that this is not open. So we know the FMS is commanding. Constraint, the A300 won't obey constraints on its own. That's why we needed to set 5,000. So the A320, if we set 10,000, the A320 would have stopped at 5,000 anyway, but the A300 doesn't. So you always need to follow your constraints on the charts with what you have on the FCU. It is commanding now 220, and then after this turn, it will automatically accelerate to 250. Bear in mind, now it's done something weird, always check the FMA, because now it has reverted to ALT. It has come out of profile, it has reverted to ALT, and you can see that it opened the speed window. So now, you see that it won't accelerate automatically to 250. So it's not receiving data from the FMS at the moment, so it will not accelerate automatically. We'll see in a second. So now it's using the pre-selected speed that we had selected before. So you can see now, passing this point, is already targeting Kilo Kilo Sierra 1.7, but it hasn't accelerated to 250. If we press Profile, you can see this changes to Profile Alt instead of Alt, and it's going to accelerate to 250. Then over here, let's check what was saying the FCOM here. Landing, so thrust reduction altitude. Engine thrust goes to climb setting, and it did it. The TRP goes from flex to auto, and it's correct. Landing gear lever, we move it to neutral, so move it one notch down. And that allows us to set the auto brake. If you ever find you cannot set the auto brake, normally that's the reason. Last flaps, we have zero and slats retracted and you can see zero zero back valves we didn't put them off so they are on now let's start our climb let's pretend ATC has cleared us to I don't know 15,000 feet which is actually being in the UK is going to be a flight level 150 we don't need to do anything as I said the A300 doesn't obey the constraints so as soon as you put 15,000, it's going to start climbing automatically. Because it's a fly level in Europe, we can already set the altimeter to standard. So we pull for standard here, and we scroll this one to 1013 or 2992. Profile thrust, profile climb, and nav. Always check the FMA. 
make sure the plane is doing what you expect it to do. We finish the aircom, APU bleed as required, they are off, APU is off, ignition is off, ice protection not required, signs we keep them around in 10,000, TCAS is on TARA, so we can do after takeoff checklist, after takeoff line checklist. Slats and flaps are retracted, landing gear is up in neutral, packs are on, altimeters they set both on standard. After takeoff checklist complete. So climb, uh, the climb page over here, this one I normally, um, so this one is triggered by passing 10,000, basically. So once we're at 10,000, bear in mind this one wasn't a, a European operator, so that's why you see retract lights at 10,000. So at 10,000 we would check the landing lights, double check everything is off as it should be. FMA, the normal climb mode is profile thrust, profile climb, and we have them there, perfect. When selecting a nuclear flight level, FMA indication check announced, clear altitude on PFD check as we've done before. When 1,000 feet below the clear altitude announce 1,000 to go. And monitor reduce in vertical speed and etc. like we did when we leveled off. Something that normally is done in Europe that you can add to add a little bit of workload to make it more fun. To avoid TCAS calls, once you are 2000 for level off, from level off, you say 2000 to go. You can pull the knob here for vertical speed and reduce the vertical speed to 2000. And then once you are 1000 feet away, you reduce to 1,000 feet per minute. Again, bear in mind that the only problem with that is that then the speed is not controlled by the FMS, so be aware of that. We're still on 250 because we're obeying this constraint over here. Now let's monitor what the FMA is going to do. Speed, Alt Star, and again it's Alt Star, it's not Profile Alt. So we have passed the speed constraint, but we're not accelerating because we're in Alt and not in Profile Alt. So if we press Profile, again you can see now we're in Profile Alt and we're accelerating to actual climb speed, which is 325. So let's set, or oh actually, Let's, we'll do that in a second. Let's stay 15,000 for a second, so then that we can talk about what it says here on the FCOM. So we'll continue here. PFCDU, we set it to progress page. PNFCDU stays on flight plan. Altimeters, we set them also at 10,000 feet. We remove constraint and we put airport increase the range so we have a little bit more situational awareness and another thing to do is to go on to the second flight plan and copy the active so we don't have the return anymore we have a copy of the active put back to progress and then let's read what he says about cruise flight level if ATC clears the aircraft to intend a cruise flight level or above there is no need to modify the cruise flight uh, inserted in the in a page during the copy preparation. 
either cruise flight level will be taken automatically into account by FCU alt knob selection. So that means that if ATC now decided to make us a cruise at 370, you see here the cruise level is set at 350. But if we wind this up to 370, we just need to pull. The plane is going to climb and automatically here we see 370, new cruise altitude, 370. What the FCOM tells you though, that if ATC limits the cruise flight level to a lower level than the one that we originally selected, it is necessary to insert this lower cruise flight level in the progress page manually. So if we had planned 370 and ATC cleared us to 350, once we pull this, we would climb at 350, as you can see here, but the progress page has not changed. So at that point, we need to manually change to 350. Otherwise, the plane will never activate the cruise phase once it reaches 350 because it thinks it should be reaching 370. So be careful with that. At this point, we do have the tick of climb checklist below the line. Actually, this one doesn't simulate the below the line. The below the line on this one would be altimeters. The line normally is, is just after packs. Because of course, the altimeters could be reset. If you were in the States, it would be 18,000. You're not going to wait until 18,000 to check the other items. Radar with just the tilt angle, depending on aircraft altitude. So normally, at this point, we would do a slightly downward tilt. There we go. And then it tells you what we just did. When the time permits, recopy the active flight plan in the secondary if an immediate return flight plan has been constructed. Checked optimum and maximum altitude capability. So here the optimum is 352. We are at 350, so that's good. If it's increased range, and once all the constraints have been cleared off, select Airport for Situational Awareness, which is what we just did. And that's it. That's all for the climb. The next is going to be the cruise. So I'm going to stop now, and I'm going to see you back once we reach the cruise. So welcome back. Here we are in the cruise. So let's have a look at the FCOM cruise part. Now thrust rating panel check. We're checking that the limited mode indication is CL, set CR if not in profile, but we are in profile so CR activated automatically so we are in cruise. ECAM memo status check. So let's press Press status over here. All normal, all good, clear. You can system page. We will review all the system pages. So you can do a quick scroll of the system pages. Make sure that there's no orange indication. Everything is in the green. You can do, go this on long cruise every now and then, just pass the time, check the temperature in the cabin, it's okay check for fuel but we'll do a fuel check in a second and that's it so we keep scrolling all of them then we do flight progress we check so when we're flying a flight a, a waypoint over here for example we are now about to overfly soar up so we would check um mostly the time now here we still have the chrono going so let's keep it that way Let's blank the FCOM, checks in brief. Let's go and find that waypoint, which is sort up. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. Sort up over here. We were supposed to be at sort up 23 minutes after departure, and it's actually 20, it was 26, so we're a little bit late. And the fuel should be 12. 0.3 estimated fuel on board and we have 12.7 so as you can see 
that initial prediction that was really, really pessimistic has already completely changed and now we already have more fuel than we're supposed to. So that's why, don't worry, I, I'm, uh, you have plenty of fuel if you plan with same brief. So that, that's all good. That matches. So close in brief, reopen the FCOM. Uh, optimal flight level, we check that again. So we're here, the optimal is 355 and we're 350, so we're good to stay there. You can only step climb, of course, by 2000 feet. So unless it was 365, I wouldn't uh, climb to 370. Navigation accuracy, check. So navigation accuracy, we do it this way. We take a um, VOR, which we have here. In this case, this is auto-tuned and it's giving us here a DMA distance of 15 miles. Now what we're going to do, we take this identifier, Charlie Hotel Whiskey, we put it in the bearing distance, select the correct one, and check the distance here. So here is giving us 16 miles, here is giving us 16 miles, so there was discrepancy of literally just half a mile. So it's perfect. So it means that the inertia reference system, the IRS, is aligned correctly. And if there was a bigger discrepancy, then it would mean that you can no longer trust the IRS. So you're, uh, you might need with big discrepancy to stop um, using the nav mode. And um, here it tells you satisfactory if the difference in, in, in the distance is three miles en route, two miles in TMA, and one mile on approach. Now, on the progress page, now at this point here, we'll put again arrival, which was Lima Echo India Bravo 06. So we have distance to destination. Now, um, next bit is radar tilt adjust, so near zero degree tilt setting so up to 20,000 and a higher altitude is about 20,000 slightly downward tilt and we had that already from the climb so slightly downward tilt we have it cabin temperature we monitor we've already checked it and it was 23 so we're good and if you want a slightly fresher you can start changing here with the knobs and that's all really for the cruise page so Yes, we don't need anything else. The only thing we need to check as soon as we get on the cruise is good to check when is you're gonna be when is gonna be your top of descent. It doesn't give you a distance uh, to top of descent like it does in the A320. So all you get to check is to scroll down, go and check where your top of descent is, and check the time. So the time is 14:39. It's now 13:28. So we have an hour and ten minutes to top of descent. I'm now gonna skip ahead the video and I'll see you when we are closer to the police center. So see you shortly. So here we are, the second part of the cruise approaching the top of descent. So the top of descent should be coming up at 1433 which gives us around about 15 minutes to um, do the descent preparation phase. So let's have a look at the FCOM, descent preparation. We're gonna check the ECAM memo page. Over here, check status on the memo page, just in case any system failed while we were in the cruise, everything is fine. Weather and landing information, we'll obtain the weather and destination. We're going to get refresh here and check the meter 030 at 6. So runway 06 is still valid. The uh, QNH is 1030. So as a reminder, we already put it on the standby. Also, on top of being a reminder, it will tell us how much altitude we will lose or gain once we change. So 400 feet. Um, which means when we change we might have to lose to use a little bit of speed brake 
uh, but that's not too bad. Then landing elevation, we're going to set the landing elevation, so we check our charts and see what's the landing elevation. Ibiza, yeah, makes sense, is sea level 23, so we round to the nearest 50, so that's zero. Then the fuel, we check the flight of it performed below, flight level 200, check the can fuel page. Uh, we're okay, we, anyway, we would check against the plan, but it's 8.7. The operational flight plan gave us arriving with 6.6, .6, so we have plenty. We'll definitely end up landing with quite a bit extra. Then we're going to check um, FMS landing data, set the speed bags on the standby ASI, which we cannot, it would be over here but we can't, it's automatic. Once it starts the descent, it will set them automatically. So all we're gonna do, we're gonna go on the FMS approach page. Landing configuration will be 30, 40. If we did 15, 20, we will select this one, but as you can see, the VR changes uh, will do 30, 40. The wind is relatively calm, so a wind correction of five is enough. So we need to add that one manually. Descent wind profile, well, while we're in this page, so we don't forget, let's enter the MTA. So we're going to check on the charts what the MTA is going to be. And MDA over here is going to be 259 cat C. Considering the V up, we should still fall within cat C. So we do 259 and we put it there also. This one goes here manually. There's no automatic call. There's no minimums call on the A300. So we need a visual reminder for ourselves as well. Then we're going to check. Let's put back the FCOM. Descent wind profile. So we'll check on the mode page. Descent forecast. We need to enter descent wind. So we bring up sim brief, go to the wind page, and here we have the winds at descent. So we're going to enter 310, 296 at 23. Then we have 200, 306 at 23 and then we're going to put 100 271 at 7 at destination we have 030 at 6 030 at 6 and that is done so back to the FCOM for cat 2 or 3 approach, set the age on the FCU. If you were not doing a 2 or 3, like we are normally, we would press the age and set it to 5 to avoid various calls. But at the moment, setting the DH bugs the speed window, so you're not able to control the speed. So we need to avoid doing that and blank it. We're going to check the flight plan and the star approach insertion that well, we have already done it of course on long haul you wouldn't enter them at departure you would wait until you're instructed but we've already done it so there's no need for that navigate we set the navigate as required so let's have a look at the chart so on arrival we need one 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 decimal one gonna set that one 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 decimal one and the course is gonna be zero six one there we go so just to double check 
111.1 and 061, that's the ILS. Perfect. So, continue. FMS flight plan. Thoroughly check the whole flight plan using the scroll key. Use ND plan mode while scrolling the flight plan on the CDU. Check in FMS flight plan is consistent with arrival and approach charts, waypoints, and constraints. So, let's see how long we have to do this. Top of the center, 1432. So, we have nine minutes. Okay, perfect. So, let's put on to plan 15 miles. And we're going to try and do that. Now, it's going to be difficult to show Navigraph and both the ND and the FNC. Let's see if we can do that. Not really. Okay, let's try this way. So if we check against the charts, the arrival starts at Corda. So Corda, there we go. And then we go all the way down to Demev, and then we have the approach. That's perfect. So if we want to just check the waypoints and make sure they're consistent, we have Corda is going to be the first waypoint, so which is before the top of descent. Then we have India Bravo 810. The constraint is about 5,000. A, a good thing to do now, the A300 VNAV is not the best in the world. Uh, apparently the real plane was already not great and any builds um, simulates this correctly apparently because very often a um, VNAV at certain waypoints it tends to jump up and down. So it's a very good habit to check that the altitude loss between waypoints is consistent with the mileage. Now it's very difficult when you have constraints because it always only tells you the constraint here so you don't know how, how much it's going to be so often i delete the constraint that are non relevant so here for example here we're going to be at 115 so any constraint here above four and five thousand really doesn't need to be there so i delete those go on to there click on the right clear alt and return and i delete all of those a better idea of what's going to happen. So now we can check that ADX350 and Negre is going to be at 22. So we're supposed to lose 13,000 feet. Rule of three. To lose 13,000 feet, we need three times the thousands of feet. So 13, we need 39. If you click on next page, you're going to see how many miles there are between ADX and Negre. So we need 39, we have 37, so that's good enough. Here we're losing 6, we need 18, and we have 15, doable. Here we're losing 5, uh, we're losing 5, so we need 15, and we have 3, that's not ideal. Let's check the next one. The next one we have. Oh, that's not okay. The next one we're losing nothing, but we're losing speed. But we have 15. So 3 and 15 is a total of 18. So we need to lose 5. We need 15 and then we need to lose a, um, 70 knots and we need seven miles for that so with a little speed break we should be able to do that and then we go on to the final part of the arrival over here we start having speed constraint so 220 the speed constraint are uh, constraint after a two tot so we'll slow down and then from there to Demev where we need to be 
Let's see where we need to be a 3000. We're going to have to be a 3000 at Osnook. But there's quite a lot of mileage to lose that last bit. So from 11,000 feet, we have 7, 3, 13, 16, 19, 22, and 25. Twenty-five to lose eight thousand feet, so that makes sense. Perfect. That's all good. Now let's check. Move back onto maps. And let's see where is the top of the descent. Top of the descent is still forty miles away, so we still have a little bit of time. There we go. So the plan is quite quite easy here because there's going to be deceleration very early, so we're going to be at two twenty here. Turn on to Demev at two ten. At Dem. Demev is four miles from Tivum and then four miles from Osnuk. So once we turn around, here we have another four miles. So we're going to be at 11 plus four plus four plus four. So we're going to be at 23 miles. So that's quite a long intercept. We might decide to cut this a little bit short. For example, here at IB. 912 we could decide to turn and cut which is pretty much what ATC very often would make you do instead of flying the entire procedure they would make you take a little bit of a shortcut um perfect so let's have another look oh you might not have seen some of the thing but hopefully we got most of it um there we go so Finish on the FCOM. FMS plan, we checked it. Secondary flight plan. In case we were not sure where we're landing, we could enter on the secondary flight plan a different approach. Or if there was a separate runway and they were using both and etc., you could modify the secondary flight plan and choose another approach. Um, in our case, there's no doubt where we're going to land, so we're going to leave it as it is. We're going to do an approach briefing. Just to check, uh, Navid have been tuned, we are aware of ILS, we check the star, the approach transition, missed approach altitude, so we can, missed approach procedure, so we can have a look at that. The MSA is 2800, not really a big concern, we're going to be about 4000 above the island, and then after that it's all going to be over the water, so MSA we don't really need to worry about. As long as we don't descend below this constraint of 4000. Then over here, the rival, we have this tuned 111.1, 61 degrees. The Kleisler capture is going to be at 2000. We might intercept a little earlier at 3000. Airport elevation is 23, as we said. The MSA is 2800. Missed approach. Climb run, we're heading, then turn right, not before 2 DME from IBA at maximum 185 onto 172 to intercept and follow radial 121 EBA. So it's heavy, you are ah, that's a waypoint EBA. Okay, so EBA we might want to auto tune it, um, um, hard tune it, but we could go on the progress page and hard tune EBA just in case. We'll have to go around 117.8. This one is the correct. At the point, I believe, if you switched to VOR navigation over here, we would have tuned 117.8. We could also reset this oh past it one two one okay so let's stop this for a second because we're approaching the top of descent now differently from the a320 here we can already wind down and pull and we're gonna get an armed profile descent it's already flashing because we are at 10 miles 
So instead of descending already when you pull, it's only arming the descent and then it will automatically initiate the descent when we're closer, normally in between five and six, seven miles. So let's monitor it, it should start descending very soon. See the bugs have been set automatically now because we reached the top of descent and we started retard profile descent and this is the vertical deviation from the profile so we need to continuously monitor this and at this point we put progress page we see vertical deviation compared to the to the vertical profile you can see there is saying minus 70 it matches what it's indicating here slightly below which is good let's uh, finish reading over here this is what we just did so it says descent clearance obtained. When descent clearance is given, turn the FCU altitude knob to select a clear altitude, pull the knob, and then check profile thrust and profile descent armed. Anti-ice has required, we don't need it at the moment. Ignition, we don't need it. And let's check the next page. So descent initiation, Descent will be initiated automatically in profile mode at the top of the descent point, provided the lower altitude has been preset on the FCU. It then also tells you how to initiate an early descent or a delayed descent after the um, top of descent. To monitor the descent on the pilot flying CDU, we set the progress page, which you have here. It also tells us the distance from destination so it's always good to do especially as we said here that the VNAV is a little bit unreliable always a cross check so we are at 30,000 feet 30,000 we need 90 miles to lose 30,000 and we have 95 miles we also need to lose some speed so that seems a little bit tight um, but we'll keep monitoring the profile Here is explaining profile mode is the most probably used profile descent indicated on the FMA, the aircraft descent along the descent flight path, VDEV is provided on progress page, and etc. Everything we just discussed. If we were in heading, then we would need to track that little symbol that tells us at what altitude, at what distance we're going to level off at the altitude that we selected. So here you see. The blue arrow is telling us where we when we will reach 20,000 feet. And if I start winding down, you can see 18,000, 17,000, and this one moves forward. So this is a good indication as well of um, how your descent is going to go. Then when each new descent clearance is given by the ATC set on the FCU, and so forth and so on. Lastly, here is explains in profile mode the descent is performed by idle thrust, maintaining the required descent path by pitch control, thus the aircraft speed will vary with the pitch and is not directly controlled. So of course there's a little bit of leeway in the way it controls the speed. It will prioritize the profile and within a certain margin around the speed that is commanded here by the blue bug as long as it stays within a certain margin it will stay in retard but if the speed varies too much two things will happen so it explains it here so if we were too fast it will start fa flashing on the MCDU more drag so we will need to use spoiler to make sure we stay on profile while if it were to be too low the speed it will turn from retard to well it will say less drag if you have speed breakout um, otherwise here instead of retard it will change to profile speed because at that point the engines will spool up to maintain the desired speed none of that is happening which means that we are descending correctly. 
Now, descent adjustment here explains everything on how to manage the descent in case anything happens. Not going to go through it because today we're good. Radar tilt will adjust it, we'll keep it at this point to avoid ground returns. We'll point it upwards a little bit. Terrain on, eight, on um, NT, again we said the terrain doesn't work. If we needed it, we could activate it. But it's a lovely day, we can see terrain and we'll be over the sea, so that's not a problem. Altimeters, set QNH. Let me wind this down to 10,000 in the meantime. Set QNH on all altimeters when approaching a transition altitude and when cleared for an altitude. Slight difference between Europe and the US. The US you'd always switch at 18,000 feet, while in Europe you would switch to local QNH when you're instructed to descend to an altitude. So, for example, let's say they click this to um, descend to flight level 100. We will still keep standard. But if they instructed us now to descend to altitude 7,000 feet on Ibiza QNH, which is 1030, at that point we would switch to local QNH. So we will come here and we will say 1030. Perfect. Because of the change, as we said before we started descending, we gained 400 feet because of the change of QNH. We are now uh, above the profile and speeding, so we'll anticipate that a little bit. And we'll put half spoilers to remanage our energy. We're now on profile, slowing down. There we go, we can now store the spoilers. Navigation accuracy, we can again check the navigation accuracy. We know we're good, let's start. Planning for the standard approach. Now, technically, where are we? This initial approach, again, is something that we do at 10,000 feet. So we'll anticipate it a little bit as we need to discuss things. It takes always a lot longer to do things while explaining them and just doing them. So we'll start doing it now instead of 10,000. Ignition, we will set it as required. So select ignition again if we had um, turbulence, precipitation, heavy rain, we would turn it on. We don't need it. Signs can go to on. External lights, again, this is not a European company, so we we'll turn on the lights at uh, 10,000 feet. Especially a British company would, um, well, I mean, the, it all depends on the company. Everybody has their own SOPs. I work with the SOP from an airline that turns on the light, especially an Airbus that are ex um, extendable um, lights and they can increase the fuel consumption up to 5%. So they only turn on the landing lights when intercepting the localizer. Uh, so we'll hold back on the lights. Positioning, rule of thumb, 9,000 feet at 250 knots at 30 miles from touchdown. So we are now at 50 miles from touchdown and 13,000 feet. So again, gross check. 13,000 feet, we need 39 miles, we have 48, so we're good. Uh, Navcom frequency, we have them, we would uh, tune of course the VHF now, making sure that we have approach and we have a tower as well. Always remember to set tower, nothing worse than being told to switch the tower when you're on your ILS and you haven't tuned it. Uh, we check Radar tilt and D at 10,000 feet will re put, put again the constraint over here so we can see the constraints ahead of us and also we switch to 
ILS so we can start seeing the deviation scale from the localizer and the glide slope. We're reaching 10,000 feet, so you can see the FMA starting to obey the constraint for 250 and also it should go then to 220. Now we're a little higher on the profile and we have a lot of speed to lose, so it will be good to use a little bit of spoiler now. Let's do the approach checklist while we're here. Approach checklist, we have signs have been set, briefing is confirmed, ICA status has been checked, altimeters they set both on 1030. Minimums is set and it's 259. We can hear the engines pulling up, which means that we can stall store the speed brake. Ignition continuous relight, we don't need it. Landing elevation has been set and is zero, sea level. So approach checklist complete. Turn the page, final approach. So the way this is gonna work, and again, we are now high, 420. As I was telling you, it, sometimes it jumps up. So now we're all of a sudden 400 feet high. So spoilers and try and regain the profile. So reading the FCOM, again, FCU, green dot speed. So this is for the final approach. So we're going to select green dot speed. Remember that the plane will always, now little caveat, in profile, the plane controls the speed. First of all, we're that he hasn't obeyed at 220 knots here. Because we are in nav and it should have obeyed that speed constraint. So let's start winding down to 3000 and then see what it does with the speed at the next waypoint. We're still high. No, we're on profile, so we're good. So technically, the plane will always follow the speed commanded by the FCU. But the moment we select on the approach page, final approach, no matter what speed is in the FCU, the plane will slow down to the minimum speed available for that configuration. So in clean configuration, we'll slow down to green dot, slats 15 and zero, and we'll slow down to S speed and etc. So we can start doing that because for some reason it's not following the speed constraints that we have, which is not what should be happening. So we'll activate final approach. As you can see here, the blue bag has disappeared. It's now commanding 134. Another slight issue with the inbuilt is that sometimes, even though Obviously now we should command green dot speed and not go below green dot speed because without flaps we could stall. Sometimes it doesn't do that and it falls below and it actually tries to slow down to 134. So you need to monitor that and be careful. To avoid that, you can simply start managing the speed yourself. But whereas the A320, you can pull for manage speed and manage the speed yourself and still descend on profile on the A300 once you pull to manage the speed yourself you're always gonna refer to level change so at this point you will go down fast without following the profile so be careful of your constraints and what you have below you if you decide to manage the speed yourself so let's do a little experiment at this point. Could have done it before, but if we wanted to cut a little bit of track, what we would do, we could push the heading selector to synchronize with our current heading, wind it to the side, click heading select, and pretend we're being vectored. Once we're on heading select, we need to make sure that we have level change, 
Let's start slowing down to 210. And let's pretend we're vectoring ourselves onto the approach. Of course, this doesn't save much, but it, just to show how it's done and how to manage the FCU, the autopilot panel. So the final course is 6-1, so we want to do an intercept around about 40 degrees. So let's put 101. There we go. Now, the FCU might not clear, as you see, it's not cleared this point, and it might not clear this point. We're intercepting the localizer, so before we get too close, we press land, and that will activate localizer in blue and glide slope in blue. So they will automatically engage when we capture the localizer. This waypoint, if we open the page, the flight plan, IB930, it has cleared it. Now, if it is in green, which is good. If we cut more instead of cutting, so lock star, sorry, we just captured the localizer, so we're good. If we cut more, we the FCU might not have cleared the points before these. In that case, it's very important that you clear them manually. So you clear manually or you do a direct to the point ahead of you. So in this case, TVOM, for example, we would just do a direct to TVOM. So the flight plan is sequenced correctly. And then we can do the missed approach procedure. Now we monitor the DME. We're at 17 miles. Here it tells us that Slats 15 should be extended not later than 3 nautical miles prior the FAF. Let's do a glide slope capture at 3000. So we have a little bit more time to do things by the book. We now have speed alt star because we're leveling off. The final approach fix, I'm checking on the chart. We saw it before, it was at 11 DME. So at 14 DME, we want to start selecting plus. 15 so slats 15 sorry that's the very big distinction slats 15 and flaps zero let's turn the lights on as we said i'm just gonna hold for the nose light until we have clearance 14 miles let's start putting slats 15 and flaps zero the maximum speed is 250 we're at 210 so we're good now, as the FCOM says, slats extended, FCU, we set S speed. So this S over here on the PFD, we set it on the FCU. So we start slowing down. Rule of thumb, we want to be at 200 knots by 10 miles. And then I go normally simply from there at 180, at 8 miles, 166 miles. So we're good. Just before intercepting the glide slope, glide slope is coming down. We have glide slope blue, so we're good. Just before intercepting the glide slope, we set, let's say half a dot, we set plus 15. Plus 15 speed, maximum speed is 215. We are below that, we're good. So let's go with plus 15. And now we start slowing down to F speed, which we cannot see, and it will appear somewhere over here. We have now glide slope star. When we intercept the glide slope, we set the missed approach altitude, which today is 3,000 feet. So we can just state that missed approach altitude is set. Here we have auto land lights, no needed, FMA, check on the FCOM again, TCAS is set to TA, localizer capture is done, runway heading, we can set it now, so we can push the heading selector to synchronize the heading in case of a missed approach. The missed approach has been sequenced correctly, as you can see, it's been drawn. We're now still at 180 at 7 miles. This is definitely not correct. Slats 15, slats 15, not slowing down. So we're going to put the gear down. 
to help us slowing down. Once the gear goes down, we arm the spoiler. Maximum speed for flaps 20 is 205. We are on 180, so we can set flaps 20. The FCOM gives us FCU V up. V up, we said uh, it was going to be 134, so now we can select flaps full. Maximum speed for flaps full is 175. We are at 160, that's it, flaps full. And at this point, we set the approach speed of 134. Let's pretend we've been cleared. We set taxi, we're clear for landing. We should have announced altimeter alive. I was busy, my bad, at 2500, and the altimeter comes alive. We checked that it makes sense because we're over the sea. We should have checked that this number matched this one, and it practically does. Now we're just gonna do our landing checklist. Landing gear is down, auto brake, we'll set it to low. And this kid is checked, slats and flaps is 15, uh, sorry, 30, 40, and the spoiler is armed. So next thing is to check the decision altitude, and we're gonna say whether we continue or we go around if we're not visual. We're visual, so at the, at the missed approach altitude, sorry, at the MDA, we can just state that we're going to land. Skip all of that, and we have landing. Let's focus on, on this. The auto throttle automatically retards the thrust levers at 30 feet on the A300, but I have hardware throttle, so I'll need to retard them manually as well. I'm going to deactivate the autopilot by pressing the red button there twice. Continue the approach. We are at MDA, so continue, minimums, continue. Aiming for the touchdown zone. 50, I retard manually the thrust levers. There we go. Reverser, reverser full, we check the spoilers. Reverser, we cannot see the lights, but they are activated. D cell, monitor auto brake, 80 knots, we put reverser to idle. Take over the braking manually. And at taxi speed, we store the reversers. Make an exit over here. We'll pass the line over here and come to a stop to just check the actions we did. There we go, let's stop here for a second. If we check the FCOM, this is what we just did. We did perform the flare, process when monitor idle, as in it's automatic. But again, if you have hardware, you have to retard them anyway. If you wait for the auto retard, sometimes it tends to float a little bit. So personally, I disconnect with the red button here, the auto throttle at 40 and I retard. And as you can see, we did a very smooth um, landing and we didn't float. If you wait for the automatic retard, sometimes it tends to float a little bit because it retards them too late. Then it touched down, we, auto we activated the reverser. You could check the activation, but uh, because of my point of view, I can't see them. I can see the lights. 
if I activate it now, you can see reversal unlocked and then it turns to reversal green. But you can hear um, the noise of the reversal activating. So you have that as a confirmation. You apply maximum reverse thrust. Then the ground spoilers, we check the extension over here. They're still extended, as you can see, by the arrows over there. We checked direction control with the pedals at 80 knots. We announced 80 knots, a reverser went to idle, and at taxi speed, the reverser are stored. That's it. After landing, brake fans, if installed as required, brakes are at 250. That seems a bit exaggerated for a low um, auto brake with nearly no manual braking, but we'll start the brake fans. Landing lights retracted. We'll turn off the runway turn off lights as well. Strobe goes to auto. Ignition off if it was on. Ice protection will go all off and it wasn't on. APU will start, so master switch and start switch. Ground spoiler disarm. ATC standby. We actually put a transponder until we're at gate. TCAS is the same. Radar off, so we switch here to off. Pitch trim, one degree nose up. Slats and flaps, zero and zero. And we do the after landing checklist. Lots and flaps are retracted, transponder is on expander, where the radar is off, the spoiler is disarmed, and APU is started. Perfect. So we can continue taxiing. Let's check at what gate we want to go and park. We are going to take two seven. We can also turn off the flight directors so that resets completely the um, autopilot or the FMA disappears we can reset the constraint there as well let's try and make this turn speed we reset it to 100 so if it's a turnaround case and we have another flight we don't risk thinking we set the V2 when it's reali in reality is V up from the flight before. Same with the altitude, you can reset that to zero. So GSX, let's request Gate 27. So parking, we take nose light off just before we turn, not to blind. Grand crew. Parking brake accumulator pressure, we have accumulator pressure, so we're okay to set the parking brake. Coming up to 2.7. Slow down, 7-8 knots is more than enough. Marshaller is hiding behind 
this sign, which is not great. And if he's making us turn or yeah. There we go. Perfect. We can set the parking brake. Let's go through the F comment again. Parking brake is set. APU bleed. The APU is available, so we can turn off the engines. APU bleed goes on. Engine go off. Elapsed time off. We still have the chrono here. Elapsed time is 2.18. External lights, they should be all off. Slides should be disarmed. They're not. We need to do that manually. So we're going to go here. Grand equipment. Disarm all doors. So now they are disarmed. Cabin pressure should be, the differential pressure over here, should be zero, which is good. Seat belt can go off. Ground contact established parking brake would go off once we have the chocks, so we could set the chocks. And then turn the parking brakes off, and that helps cooling down a little bit quicker. Fuel pumps go off. Apart from one of the inner tank pump left that we keep for the, P the, the APU. And then window heater and flow heater go off. IRS, we will turn them off or as required. So let's pretend we're doing a turnaround and we'll keep them on. Parking checklist completed. Let's see if we have the parking checklist over here. We do so parking checklist APU bleed is on, engines are off, differential pressure is zero, lights and sign as required, fuel pumps are off, window probe are off, and parking brake and chocks. Parking brake are off and chocks are on. Parking checklist complete. That's it. Welcome to Ibiza. There we are. We've made it. So I hope you found this useful. Now on the last bit of information, if you scroll beyond the parking part here, you'll find also standard calls, which I find something quite interesting and useful. So all the different calls that you do throughout the flights, a bit of procedure as well, and etc. So that's a little added bonus to um, add a little bit to your um, simulation and to the immersion with the fuel policy at the end as well. Now, as I said, I hope you found this useful. Thank you very much for following. Thank you for watching the video. Um, of course, if you like to find more material on Microsoft Flight Simulator, like and subscribe so I can gauge whether I can step fully into making tutorials for Microsoft Flight Simulator. There's quite a lot of uh, exciting release coming up in the next year. The 777, we have the 757 at some point and many others. And I would be delighted to create more tutorials like this for upcoming planes if there is demand, of course, because it is a fair amount of work. But You'll find the FCOM. Please feel free to download it. As I said, it's available on flightsim.to. I will put a link in the description. And again, we would be delighted to see you at Danair Virtual. Um, please join us with a very relaxed VA. We don't have any minimum requirements for 
flying, so you don't need to do that classic flight once a month to keep your tenancy. Um, you can fly whenever you want. Um, we just only ask that people respect the correct planes and correct liveries to fly routes. Apart from that, super, super relaxed. We have a lovely Discord with a lot of very helpful people. So I'll put the link as well to our website in the description. And as I said, we will love to see you for some flights with Dan Air Virtual. Any questions you have about the tutorial or about anything in general, please feel free to leave me a comment. Um, but for now, just thanks again for following and I hope I'll see you on the next tutorial. Thank you very much. Bye now.